And our Meet the Musician guest today, this wonderful woman, oh, so nice. is Thanks. a Golden Globe award-winning actress and an accomplished singer. That's the part that some people don't know about, right. uh, but you're going to learn a lot about that tonight. Uh, she has starred in such iconic television programs as Married with Children, of course, uh, Eight Simple Rules, Futurama, can't forget that one, and of course, the current FX smash, Sons of Anarchy. But she's also a critically acclaimed singer-songwriter, and she began singing with, uh, well, a long time ago. She was with Bette Midler, and she sang back up for Bob Dylan, Etta James, Gene Simmons, Tanya Tucker. I mean, talk about a wide variety of, of artists. Olivia Newton-John and her new album is covered, and it comes out next week. So let's give her a round of applause for Apple's Meet the Musician, Katie Segal. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, now you started your career as a musician. I did, yes. Before you were a famous television star. I think I started my life as a musician. Television yes. star. Yeah. Um, you became famous for creating award-winning characters in both film and television. How did the transition happen? Uh, you mean from singing to acting? Yes. Well, I was, um, you know, I started playing music when I was really young, when I was a kid, and... Um, I, uh, I decided early on that that was the path I wanted to take. I wanted to be a singer-songwriter when I grew up. And um, I spent a lot of time doing that. I, um, and all throughout my 20s, that was really my pursuit. I, um, I made a couple of records. and uh, you know, But to really pay the bills, I would work with other people. And I, I would, um, those were the days when publishers would give people songs. They'd be trying to push their music to their artists. And so I would sing... I would sing demos for publishers, for various artists. And, and, and then I started working as a background singer, and it really, you know, paid my bills. And, um, you know, at a certain point, I started to think, um, you know, I needed, a, I needed a bigger vision of things, and uh, I wanted to open things up. I did a musical in Los Angeles, this little rock musical that these friends of mine wrote, and um, an agent found me and asked if I wanted an agent, and I thought, well, that'll be a good idea. And... And then really, within about six months, I was on television. And um, you know, as a kid, my father was in the, in the uh, movie business. He was a director. And he used to tell me, you, know, you should be an actor. So I'd sort of dabbled a little here and there. But um, I, kind of, um, I had sort of a natural um, take for things. And I, I, I learned pretty much on the job. Well, when you were with Bette Midler, you were one of the Harlettes, yes. And um, that was a job that required a lot more than just background vocals. Yeah, that, I had was, to that was being a, a part of the big, giant stage show. Yeah, well, she, those were the days when the Harlettes were sort of a, a theatrical component, and they danced like crazy. And, you know, I was, I, I was a singer, so I had to really, you know, stretch outside my wheelhouse. And, um, but it was good. I, I worked very, very hard. I loved that job. It was great. And there was all the choreography. Oh, yeah, it was choreography. I'd have to sing those, those really costumes intense charts. You know, we were doing all those kind of Andrew Sisters harmonies. And, you know, you'd have to sing that while you were, you know, up and laying down on the floor, flipping your legs up in the air. And, you know, we did all kinds of wild things. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you were uh, in the studio working with some of the most iconic performers and artists, people like Etta James or Bob Dylan, was that at all intimidating to you? I mean, could you yeah. believe you were in the room with these people? Well, I, I worked mostly live with them. I didn't record with them. Um, you know, Etta, Etta used to just come over to my house and hang out, and my uh, husband at the time was uh, the bass player in her band, so I just sort of got the gig. It was kind of like, just, you know, come along. So I wasn't intimidated by Etta. I was just always in awe. You know, she was... You know, at a certain point, she'd let me go open the show for her, and I'd sing a couple songs. And she was just, you know, she was amazing. And um, Bob Dylan, that was a, you know, I only worked with him for a couple of months. And I always put it on my resume because the guy scared me so much. I was so intimidated. I was like 18 years old, and I'm singing just like a woman with Bob Dylan, and I could barely speak. And, you know, I'm sure I was doing like a horrible job. And, yeah, you know, a week before the tour, he fired half the band. And I don't know if they were as intimidated as I was, but I was, he, 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 was, uh, he was very intense. But he didn't fire you. 
Oh, he did fire me. You got fired by oh, Bob yeah. Dylan? Yes. Bob Dylan fired you? Yeah, he did, man. Boy. He did. Well, there's another thing he can add to his list of regrets. He probably doesn't even remember. Oh, come on. Yeah, no, he probably doesn't. We'll it was For me, it was very memorable. We'll see to it that he remembers. Well, Covered, yeah. which will be released next week, is your third album. And um, the first was in 1999, Well, and then there was uh, Room in 2004. Now, on this particular project, um, all of the songs are covers except for one. Right, right. So uh, how did you choose which songs? You must have hundreds of favorites. How did you choose the songs that you were going to put on this album? Um, once I decided, because at first, the other two, I wrote a lot of the songs on, my, on the records. And then I started the process where I thought, well, I'll, I'll write. And, and I just was not really... I was impatient with myself, and I didn't feel that I, my, I was coming up with it. So um, I just decided, once I made the switch and I decided I'm going to interpret music rather than write music, um, then it became a different kind of process. You know, it really was about finding music that... Um, some, of, some of it was very reminiscent of growing up. I wanted to not make a nostalgia record, but there's a few people that inspired me. Like, I do a Laura Nero song, and Laura Nero was really the reason that I taught myself to play the piano and I wanted to be a songwriter. So I did a Laura Nero song, I did a Joni Mitchell song. That's, those were big influences to me when I was growing up. And then I started exploring um, current songwriters. And um, so I, you know, I put a Ryan Adams song on there and um, Ray LaMontagne and, um, and then Steve Earle who kind of crosses both. You know, he's, I, I would have done the whole record with Steve Earle songs if mm. I, I love him. So. Uh, I, um, you know, and then it was just a process. We demoed a lot of songs. You, that's what you have to do and see if it translates for someone else. I didn't want to do stuff that it was just going to be, you know, the same thing that was already done. So it was, it was just a, a real process. Well, there's a Jackson Brown composition on the album, but yeah. there's also a duet with Jackson Brown on a Steve Earle song. Right. I thought that was, that was an unusual uh, choice to make, to have Jackson Brown duet with you on another songwriter's. Yeah. Well, that was before song. we cut uh, a Jackson song, and we had um, we were working on "Goodbye," the Steve Earle song, and we Bob, my producer, brought in um, a Spanish guitar player and this violin player that um, that had that had worked with Jackson Brown and worked with Leonard Cohen, and he thought, you know, Bob said this should be a duet, and I know Jackson. I'm not even sure how I know Jackson, but socially I know him just from being around and. You know, I just, you know, I went to where he, he was, he was sitting in one night with some friends and I just went and talked to him about it and he, um, he said, yeah, he would come and sing and it was, for me, it was really um, an honor to have him come and sing on the record. Well, the Jackson Brown song uh, that you have on the record is For a Dancer. Yeah. And that's from 1974? I think so. About 1974. Right. And, Late uh, for the Sky. It's going to be on next week's... Sons of Anarchy. Yes. Yes. Do you have some context you can provide? For that us? song? For, well, for that song and how it's going to be uh, used in next week's show. Oh, no, no, no. I can't tell you, you that. You can't do that. But you know, it's a very emotional song. It was one of the few songs. It was the last song I recorded for the record. And, you know, y usually the process of finding music on the TV show is um, Bob, who's the musical supervisor, and my husband, Kurt, kind of come up with... Um, you know what they what they think would will would be good for me to sing. I sing a song every season, and in this case, Bob and I sort of talked about about it. And Bob said, "Why not about what about this song?" So we presented it to Kurt and happened to work it worked. Okay, now you just said we presented it to Kurt. Kurt's your husband. Kurt's my husband. And who, Kurt's your boss. And my boss, yeah, he's your boss. Pretty good, so right? So you go to work every day, and there he is. And then you come home at night and. There he is. That's a very unusual kind of uh, situation. Well, it's not quite like that. I mean, I actually don't see him at work that much. He's a writer, and he directs and writes. You know, he's kind of in his own little orbit, and, um, and I'm an actor. I mean, the, the thing that we mostly do together is raise children. I mean, that's really the common denominator. And you have three of those. Yeah, there's three of those. So that's really, <laughs> that kind of grounds the whole thing. We just... One in college... One in college, one is a senior in high school, and then we have a, a first grader. She's, in, she's six years old. 
And your daughter in college, what does she want to be when she, she grows up? She wants to be an actor. She wants to be an actor. Okay, well, it's... She's good. She's also a really good singer. My, ki- my kids are really talented. Well, you know... Not just because they're my kids. I'm not just saying that. Well, you have other talented relatives as well. I mean, you come from a, a yeah. show business family. It's yes. in yeah. the blood. Hmm. Yeah, I'm hoping my little one will do something else. <laughs> 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 Maybe she'll be a doctor or something. A doctor's good. A doctor. It might be hard to make a living as a doctor. Now, you have had a knack for finding television projects that, besides being successful, because there are a lot of successful shows, your shows tend to create very passionate audience reactions. People... It, 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 your shows are not shows people just watch. Your shows are people. Your shows are shows that people love. I was in a restaurant a little earlier today, and uh, the chef and owner uh, heard that I was coming here tonight, and just started to go on and on and on about Sons of Anarchy. I mean, just like crazy talk. He was, you know, let me shake your hand after you see her. <laughs> so. You know, maybe there'll be a little of her essence. And then he started telling all the people in the restaurant, she is just so awesome in that show. And then, you know, the memories that people have of Peg Bundy, uh, a character that apparently you had a bigger hand in creating than most people would think. Well, I, yes. I mean, a little bit. I Her look, the way she looked... Um, when I, when I started Married with Children, Peg was supposed to be um, sort of this dowdy housewife that didn't take care of herself and laid around the couch, you know, just a slob. And I, first of all, didn't want to play that kind of part. And my take on her was, you know, the whole relationship she had with Al Bundy was such a, um, a combative one that I just figured there had to be something hot going on behind the scenes. So I went to my audition just completely, you know, in kind of a cartoony way, but all dolled up. And they bought it. They were like, yeah, that's really what we think would be more interesting. So I had a lot to do with the look. The writing on that show was, was so funny and flawless, and that had nothing to do with me. But, mm, I, but had you not created that look, had Peg been dowdy, it wouldn't have been the same show, right? That's right. They should have paid me more money. <laughs> I should have gotten a piece. Well, especially considering the fact that it's generally understood that Married with Children and The Simpsons, those two shows, really created the Fox television I know. empire. That's true. So Rupert Murdoch should be sending it owes you me big. gifts. He should. And then, you know, Futurama was on Fox. Yes. Now I'm on FX. Mm. I am really the longest running employee of the Fox network, of the corporation. And, and, well, Futurama, another show that has a very passionate following. Yes, it does. And that was uh, your opportunity to um, uh, experience animation and voice acting. I l- uh, yes, which I love. I mean, just like radio, I think what you guys do is great. Well, we don't have to worry about hair and makeup. No, which is m- so much simpler, yes. But, the, but going in there and, uh, you know, portraying that role into a, into a microphone I know, to bring an animated character to life. And when you watched it on TV and saw your voice coming out yeah, it's of really an animated fun. character, that must have been really Even though I only do cool. one voice. I just, Leela just kind of talks like this. She kind of talks high. But, you know, everybody else on that show would do like five, ten voices. They're, they're amazing to watch. You know, Billy West and John DiMaggio and those guys are just, you know... Artists, truly. Voice artists. And um, speaking of uh, Sons of Anarchy and your husband, he has a knack for uh, uh, developing and working on shows that also attract yeah. passionate audiences because uh, it's not just Sons of Anarchy that jumps off the page on his resume. There's also The Shield. Yeah, he was on The Shield. He didn't create The Shield, but he was there for the whole seven years. He. He, start, he was a producer, executive producer by the end. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know Michael Chiklis? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, he used to be a bartender. Oh, over really? Here. Yeah, huh. not far away. I do know Michael Chiklis. Yes, and he, he, uh, he had to quit his bartending job without giving two weeks' notice because he got a television series. Oh. And he always felt that he had let his boss down, and he thought his boss was mad at him. 
And years later, he came back to New York and he visited the bar and he went downstairs to where the boss's office was and the boss had newspaper clippings about of him? Michael's oh, success hanging up on sweet. the bulletin board downstairs, which was very, very, very nice. That's a nice story. Uh, now, the live performance aspect yep. of uh, your musical career, uh, that tends to create a very intimate bond between an artist and the people who are experiencing that art uh, because it's, unme it's, un it's unmediated. It's just right there between you and them. And I like performing live. I mean, that's really, you know, that's what I did most of. That is what is, I have done most of in my life is well, I, live. I saw a video just last week of a live performance of uh, Tom Petty's Free Fallen, which is on the album. Oh, right. Have you seen that video no, yet? No, I never have. Oh, it's really, really good. I bet it's really good. It's really, really good. He's really great. And uh, you heard that song played on the radio this morning. I did, that's right. They played my record on the radio this morning, the first time I heard it on the radio. So that was nice. Thank you. It sounds cool when it's on the radio, Yes, it? it did. And you work with uh, such an incredible group of uh, musicians. I did. On the record, um, it's, uh, it's, it's not a, the total band called The Forest Rangers. On, on Sons, there's a band, The Forest Rangers, and they, they record all the music that you hear in the soundtrack. So uh, Bob Thiel, who's, who's the number one Forest Ranger, he's back there somewhere, he, he put that band together, and um, some of them came and played on my record. And we actually go out and do shows together where we play, um, half the show will be other artists that are in the Forest Rangers, other singers, and then myself as well. Now, the last time that you bought hmm. somebody else's record, oh. what was it? That's such a good question. Um, what's the last record that I bought? It might have been Justin Timberlake. <laughs> I would like that Justin record. Justin Timberlake's new record is really yeah, good. Yeah, I really liked it. And um, what's the last record I bought? But I bought, you know, I'm, I don't buy whole records anymore. I'm like the rest of the world. I buy a song here and a song there. So you're heading on to iTunes. I am. Yeah. Yeah. But you should buy all my record. You should hear every single song. Well, for one thing, the way that you, s you spend a lot of time figuring out how you're going to sequence those songs. I did, yes. Because you're trying to create uh, a special experience for the listener. Right, and I'm old school. That has a beginning and an end. That's you know? right, that's right. And it's true that uh, fewer people, especially young people, experience music in that way, but it's still how music is created. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And people should spend a little more time thinking about the experience of immersing themselves in an album. You still like to do that, don't you? Yeah, I think that's a good way to do it. What was the first record that you ever bought when you were a kid? Oh, wow. Well, my dad, uh, he gave me this Ella Fitzgerald record and then a Nina Simone record. So those were, I, I, don't, I didn't buy them, but those were records that I played over and over again. And then, um, yeah, it's interesting. The first, the first and only concert that my dad really took me to, he took me to the Troubadour in Los Angeles to see Nina Simone. And, um, and then, I, you know, I mean, there, there's lots of records. I, I loved my records. I loved them. And you still have them? Mm, I have vinyls. I, I don't have them out I have them stored away. But you still have them. I do have them. Which is similar to the experience of cracking open a book and reading it from beginning to end, is that you can revisit those albums or those books years later. And it's like visiting with an old friend that you haven't seen in a long time. Oh, yeah, or that time of your life. Yeah. So depending if you want to visit that time of your life or not. <laughs> you know, that's the key. <laughs> well, <laughs> what... Uh, uh, th this is a time in the history of the music industry when it's uniquely difficult for artists to get their music out there because, because we don't really have brick and mortar record stores anymore. I mean, there are some record stores that sell vintage recordings and stuff, but the big record stores with the huge retail displays just aren't there. You don't have a situation where a consumer walks into a store and sees 
something that they didn't know they were looking for. Right. Uh, so they can say, gee, that looks interesting. Maybe I'll, I'll check that out. Uh, so you have to find a way to get through the noise and get people's you attention. You have to be on TV, too. Yeah. See, if you're on television, you have to be sort of multi... Yeah, it's weird. It's like, I think we've become so um, uh, dimensionally focused. We're just, you know, I watch my kids, you know, my kids can't do more than, they have to do like four things at once. They can't do one thing at once. So I think in terms of marketing, it seems like you have to, you sort of have to come at it from a lot of different places. Mm -hmm. It's not just, it's not as simple as it used to be. Because ultimately what you want to do when you're in the studio recording is you want to share that moment with people that you haven't met personally, hoping that you'll connect with them and they'll connect with you and that they will enjoy what you created. Yeah, but I think it's still that way. I think that's what, I think that's what anybody who creates anything is really you know, trying to do. I mean, I think that you know, there's, there's, there's the issue of you have a voice, you need to say something, but I think it's about giving. I like to think it's about giving and being of service in that way. I think it's still that. And in the music industry, you have, and probably because of your past resume, uh, been able to be taken seriously where some people who try to move from one part of the entertainment industry to the other aren't. Well, I sort of have. I'll tell you, it's different. When I made my first record, I was on Virgin Records. I had this big record deal. It was really like, you know, the way you're supposed to do it. And at the same time, I was on Married with Children. So radio all wanted to talk to me. And here's my record. I've written every song. I've poured my soul into it. I, I really want to be taken seriously as an artist and, and, and was really determined to write everything because of that. And, you know, I would go to radio stations and all they'd want to do is talk about my television work. I mean, it was really a, a frustrating experience for me. I think things have shifted now. I think there's a little more crossover. People are so multimedia now that, you know, you can be on television and be a singer and make a movie. And, and hopefully, you know, it's just like I don't think that we need to look at people and and dumb it down for them. You know, I think that, you know, we can now, we can experience more than one thing at a time. And, um, and, I, and, you know, I think as a creative person, that's a good opportunity. You know, that's a really good opportunity. Well, we have uh, friends here who have uh, taken the time to uh, visit with you this evening who no doubt have some questions for you. So it's question and answer time. Hi, Katie. Hi. Um, what's your most memorable, I guess, aspect of your musical career and then your acting career? My most memorable aspects? Yeah, like what's your like most favorite memory? Uh, well, I have a, a really good one I was just talking to someone. When I sang with Etta James, we opened for the Rolling Stones and we played at what, what was then the Forum. I don't even know if the Forum is there anymore. Yeah, it's there. But it was the most amount of people I'd ever played in front of. And um, that was an incredible experience. That was, that was that one. And let's see, my acting. Um, you know, I've had a lot of memorable experiences as an actor. I, I can't, it's hard for me to think of one specific. Do we have another question? Katie, um... For your new album, I guess, pick three songs. What will be the appetizer, what will be the main chorus, and what will be the dessert? Wow. That's a good one. I love one. food questions. <laughs> I do love to eat. So uh, let's see. The appetizer, the main course, and then the dessert. I think the dessert would be for a dancer, which is the last song on the record. It's very sweet. I think that the main course might be Free Fallen, which is the first song on the record. And the appetizer? I don't know, man. They're a lot. They're, they're, they're all good. I like them all. <laughs> How's it going, Katie? Hey, good. I actually have a son's question um, related to your, char your character, Gemma. Um, now that Jax knows the secret of uh, that Tara was holding, how do you think Gemma's character feels now? You know, do you think she'll get her babies back? Oh, man, you can't ask me those questions. <laughs> Because I know stuff I'm not supposed to tell you. I mean, but how, how do you think her character at least feels now that... Uh, that well, I'm sure she feels a bit vindicated that the truth has finally come out. You know, if you've been watching the show, she... Well, I, I can't... You know, we can't really have that conversation because not everybody's all caught up. 
So it's that kind of show, but I'm sure she feels somewhat vindicated, would be my answer. Do you know how difficult it is to talk about TV shows today? Oh, yeah, you have to, because you don't want to spoil it. Yeah, for it's a total pain because people don't watch the show all at once like right. they used to. Right. So you, you can be talking about a show three, four days after the episode aired and still tick people off. Yeah, I know. So no water cooler. <laughs> Hi, Katie. Hi. Um, I have a two-parter. One is, um, would you do Broadway over here? Would you like to do a play or a musical? And then, one's a short one, all those hot guys on Suns. Who's the most high maintenance? Of all the guys of on Suns? The they're all really high maintenance. <laughs> they are. They, Maggie and I joke about it all the time. They're all way more high maintenance than we are. But let's see. see. Probably Kim. <laughs> Probably Tig. Um, and then, yeah, I would do Broadway. You know, I, it depends on the material. You know, I feel like, um, um, you know, I love musicals. I, I, I think I, it just kind of depends on where I would fit in that world. And, uh, you know, a lot of the reason I haven't come to New York to work is because of my children. And, um, you know, they're, they're in school and they're at certain ages. And I told my husband, though, that little one just has to be mobile. You know, she just has to, she's going to have to be on the fly. And in the front, over here. Hi, Katie. Hi. Uh, huge fan. Pleasure to meet you. Um, question for you. As an actress, what is it like to go from, say, how you did a comedic role early on with Married for Children, and then something so serious as Sons of Anarchy? Um, you know, I was looking for uh, a drama to do, because I, I, you know, once I was on Married with Children for 11 years, it became really... Um, difficult to the perception of me as an as a dramatic actor was kind of challenged, and um, you know the transition is really not that difficult. It depends on the writing, you know. It depends on what you're given to do. Um, the process of being on a sitcom as opposed to being on a film a film set or a drama that's that m medium that's a little bit different because a sitcom is more like doing a play. You do it in front of an audience. You rehearse it all week, and then you put it up at the end of the week. And you and, do it in sequence, right? And yeah. you do it in sequence. Right. You do it in order. So the process of doing um, a film television show or a movie is just, you know... It's just a different approach, and you have to really kind of mark your time so that you know where you are. In an episodic television show, it can be really complicated. I mean, this whole season, we've all looked at each other when we get to work, and we have to kind of piece together what happened, where are we now, who did what, do I like you, do I want to kill you, do I, do I think I'm going to make up with you? You know, there's just, it gets really complicated, so you have to pay attention. Thank you Thanks, so much, and thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Have a good night.